It's free throw week. Five plays. Stick around. Greetings and welcome back for another episode of Five Play Friday, the show where we look at plays, look to get better, take positives, negative, analyze the plays for what they are, were they adjudicated correctly using National Federation of High School Basketball rules? Did the correct official make the call? Were they in the proper position, etc.? Greetings, everybody. My name is Greg Austin with abetterofficial.com. If you're new to the channel, it'd be a great time to hit like, subscribe, and notify if you find value in content like this. Take a moment to share the video as well with other basketball officials so that we can all get better together. As always, have to start the show with a shout out to our show supporters, Yvette Perry, Jim Kane, Chris Williams, Jeff Jewett, and Jason Hayes. Much appreciated and much love. There's always a chance to head over to a betterofficial.coffee. There'll be a note in the show notes below. Today, we are looking at free throw scenarios. It's free throw week here at A Better Official. On Monday, we had a master class focusing on the topic. There'll be a link above to a playlist that includes all three of these videos. So we have the master class. On Wednesday, we had basketball rules expert where we looked at play scenarios using National Federation of High School rules, see where the play is adjudicated correctly. And then today we have our five play Friday where we're going to look at free throw plays. There's a link above. You can check out those videos as well. So it's free throw week. Let's look at our very first play. Oh, I see. All right, a simple play scenario. We start with something super easy, right? Ball is at the disposal of the thrower. The special rules restrictions that apply only during the restarts, our three restarts, of course, are free throws, throw-ins, jump ball, special rules and restrictions. They start when the ball becomes live. Violation by an opponent of the thrower, the official, the trail official, who's responsible for that player, correctly rules a delayed free throw violation, very straightforward, and the try misses. We will then administer a substitute free throw to replace that free throw since the violation occurred. Had the ball gone in, we would just continue as normal. Easy peasy, straightforward. For Billy Mack, it was easy peasy, lemon squeezy. <laughs> but a really straightforward play. Nothing remarkable, just the basics, right? Gives us a chance to also to review We have responsibilities in a two-person situation. This is two-person or in three-person. Responsibility for coverage, which officials we're, we're um, officiating. It would be easy for the lead on this play to also have this delayed violation because it's going to be clearly in their vision. But if we just allow the system to work and work properly, good things happen. Correct call by the officials. Not a big deal. Now, let's of course think about, well, what if this, the free thrower shot an air ball and violated? Then by rule, we would have a simultaneous violation. The free throw would be canceled, but is it possible that the thrower was distracted by that player who stumbled in their peripheral vision? Absolutely. So we need to think about disconcertion or distraction, in which case, even if there was a violation by the thrower, we would have 
a substitute free throw given on the play. Let's do this. So our first play scenario, our first video, simple, straightforward, nothing there, just a review of the basics and a delayed violation signal and a substitute free throw being awarded. Straightforward, easy. Again, we're remembering Admiral Akbar's uh, warning that it's a trap and we get into a, a soft a soft landing spot while we're administering multiple free throws, etc. And sometimes something happens on the court that startles us and sort of awakens us from that from that momentary slumber, right? That we have to recognize. So oftentimes you'll see very reaction based moves by officials in these situations. Fantastic. Let's move on to our very next play. All right, so the key here, let's take a look here. Let's bring in the arrow of renown. Right, we're of course watching this player here beyond the three point arc. They of course have a restriction that they are not allowed to break the three point arc free throw line extended until the ball contacts the ring, different from players in marked lane spaces. A common problem and a common misconception. Does this player watch NBA games? Probably, right? In the NBA, no such restriction exists. They see a play, they think, hey, I'm gonna start doing that so I can go in there and crash, etc." Easy to see why players would be confused about this restriction, or they're taking, or they may be in the same situation as us with the Admiral Akbar uh, admonition, right? They're taking a little mental time off as well. So sometimes we could see brain farts from players as well as officials in these situ in these situations. Billy Mack, you are absolutely correct. In two person, it is hard to. Hey, all right. So this also highlights the fact here, here's my feeling, right? In two person, the trail, or in three person, the center, this is the highest, this is the biggest workload you have during the game, right? What am I responsible for as the, as the center in, in three person or as the trail in two person? Well, I need to see if the thrower violates. I need to see the players in marked lane spaces that I'm responsible for violate. Huh, interesting. I need to see whether anybody crosses the free throw line prior to the ball contacting the ring, and if there's any contact on the thrower, so now I have to protect my thrower. I have, I'm in two person, I'm responsible for players behind the arc. I'm responsible to know whether the ball contacted the ring or not as well. I have a long laundry list of things to do. It's very challenging, right? When we get to three person, we may say, hey, you know, I may say in a pregame, hey, I've got a lot going on as, as, the, uh, as the center official on free throws. Trail, stay engaged. Stay engaged. If we miss something obvious, come in, put a whistle on it. Don't feel like you know, it's just the two of us officiating that free throw action. And especially help me with an air ball on the opposite side. I have a lot going on as the official in that position. Okay, so we're going to riff off that. That's play number two, but we're going to riff off that and look at a couple of similar plays.
All right, similar play. Teammate of the thrower, right, gets to the edge of the three-point line. Try is released. They cross the line. Violation is ruled. And the calling official points to the sideline for a resulting throw-in. Hmm. Right, this is how this play should be adjudicated correctly. In this instance, the official got it right. Sideline throw-in, would that be right? Spot nearest the violation? Yeah, so it's a funky situation. Almost always, free throw violations are going to go to the end line. In this instance, since it's outside the semicircle and yet not below the line from the edge of the elbow to the corner, it is a sideline throw-in. Same play, correctly adjudicated. Teammate of the thrower violates, sideline throw-in for the violation. Just the basics. Right? Let's look at something, a similar play here. Way to go! Way to go! Right, teammate of the thrower. We're getting ready. We're in the final minute of a game. This game is decided. It's 64 to 51 under a minute to go. Home team is ahead. So, as always, we can take something from almost every video clip. This is a three person game. This is our center official. They're in great position. They're focusing on what they should be focusing on. We would leave to our trail. The, the player up here, right, our player who violates up here, that would be the trail's responsibility. But let's also think about the game situation, right? You know, we get into an end of game situation, under a minute to go, we're talking as a crew, what are we saying? Do not miss anything on white, right? We don't have to find things on white, but we're not, don't want to miss anything on white. We don't want to give our losing coach any ammunition to come at the crew and create any sort of environment, right? If there's something on white and they're ahead by 13 points under a minute, let's make sure not to miss it, right? So that also comes into play on this play. But um, the trail should have been involved here. Maybe the trail was at the division line. Don't have it on this play. So another simple scenario something to take from it. Let's move on to another. So another scenario where the exact same thing happens, just need to be aware of that. You know, seeing the plays helps us. When the players tell us, hey, I'm about to go with their, with their, with their energy, with the way they lean, the way they anticipate, etc. right? We can prevent things like that. We can ward it off by just reminding them, hey, take a moment, all right? Remind them, hey, wait till it hits. Back here, we gotta wait till it hits. We can talk to them, etc. Okay, so we've had we've had four plays involving players beyond the arc. Very straightforward. The rules and restrictions. The players beyond the arc, free throw line extended, must wait until the ball contacts the ring, not the backboard, the ring, before or goes in the basket before they can cross. Simple, straightforward. We see it. We understand it. We can move forward. If the t violation is by the teammate of the thrower, the free throw is canceled, and we would go to what happens next. If it's by an opponent of the thrower, which we didn't have in these situa situations, I think all were teammates of the thrower, but if we have an opponent of the thrower, of course, we'd have a delayed lane violation, and a substitute free throw would be awarded. 
And if we have violations by both teams, both players run in, matters not who goes first, who goes second, both players violate. It's a simultaneous violation. The free throw is canceled by rule, and we would go to what happens next. If uh, it, whether it's an AP throw in or or a second or multiple free throws, you know, especially when we're working lower level games, etc. That's a role that we can play in helping to educate players. We can catch them during a dead ball, etc. Um, you know, I'm I embrace that. I embrace helping communicate rules and restrictions with stakeholders in the game, be it the players, the coaches, the administrators, just people close to the game. And, you know, guiding them towards a better understanding of the rules and the, re the, the, the philosophy that they should have a better understanding of the rules. Now, at the same time, inconsistently applied at the high school level, um, especially during, you know, for lower level games, sub varsity games, we can expect rules to be inconsistently applied and that's a factor when it comes to players and coaches, the stakeholders in the game. This player may have, say, I've done that every game this season, and you're the first ref to call it. Wouldn't expect that in this situation, but that may be their perspective. I've never known. I've always done it. All right, let's move on to play number three. Right, so we're doing kind of a, a grouping. We've got play number one, play number two with a few variations. And now let's move on to play number three. Okay, so um, a couple of years ago into Rule 9-1, a clause was added um, making it a violation for an opponent of the thrower to cross the free throw line before the ball contacts the ring in an effort to protect vulnerable free throw shooters. Only, of course, adding to the responsibility of this is a center official in a three-person game, only adding to that responsibility and leading to situations where we could have a displacement foul, as that became a point of emphasis, protecting that free throw shooter, um, layered on top of a possible violation, which adds complexity to the play. So this was a uh, NCAA women's rules um, game. At that time, this um, point of emphasis was not in place or the, or the rules restriction on the free throw line. I think subsequently that has been brought in. NCAA women says, hey, look, we want to protect free throw shooters as well. And this has become a point of emphasis on that side. But what we have here is a two-part process. By crossing the free throw line, our opponent of the thrower has committed a violation by rule in National Federation of High School Basketball Rules. This should be a delayed violation. In addition, we need to evaluate the contact. If the contact is incidental, then we have no call. If we have displacement, then there is a foul and we would need to adjudicate this play. So this play is obviously the last of multiple free throws and we could take a moment, we could take a moment to uh, see how would we properly adjudicate this play in National Federation of High School Rules. So we have an opponent of the thrower violate and then commit a foul. That's the premise we're going under. What happens next? And the free throw misses. What happens next? Since it was a delayed violation, a substitute free throw will be awarded. After that, we will enforce the foul. The penalty for the foul will either be bonus free throws or the ball out of bounds nearest the spot of the foul. So we're either going to have multiple or we're going to have bonus free throws and or an end line throw in. In either case, what we do is we clear the lane. <clears throat> we clear in either case what we do is we clear the lane, have the player shoot their substitute free throw and then enforce the foul. 
This can lead to a lot of confusion. It can lead to uncertainty. If we've snapped out of our um, momentary haze, <laughs> this could present uh, a problem. So it's great to see these plays and anticipate, well, okay, if we have this, how are we going to properly adjudicate? We are going to award a substitute free throw for the delayed violation. And then we are going to enforce the foul. What is the enforcement of that foul? We know that. Okay, partner. Hey, we're going to shoot the substitute with the lane cleared. And then we're going to go end line for the uh, resulting throw in. Or we're going to shoot bonus free throws after that with the lane filled. Okay. Great to think those these play scenarios through in advance. So when they occur, we are dynamic, clear, making statements, and getting things right, right as a crew. Okay, but let's before we go, let's recognize this is second half action. Okay, that's just something to keep in mind when we see a subsequent play. Second half action. <laughs> okay, so it's great to think these plays through in advance so that they, when they occur in our game, we've mentally gone through the exercise. Because you may not have this. This may not occur in your game once a year, once every two years, hopefully not several times in a week. But we don't necessarily get a lot of reps. We have to recognize it for what it is. Okay, why is this a delayed lane violation? The ball has yet to hit the ring. The uh, player in the third, the opponent of the thrower in the third marked lane space has crossed the free throw line before the ball contacts the ring. Just like a player from behind the arc crossing, if the opponent of the thrower from behind the arc crosses the three-point line prior, or the free throw shooter crosses the free throw line prior to the ball contacting the ring, this is a delayed violation on the opponent of the thrower. As a delayed violation, if the ball goes in, we ignore the violation. If the ball misses, we enforce the violation. Tech shooters protect dribblers, right? If we make that a focus, our game is better. We are better officials. Protect shooters is what the, why these rules. So we also understand, well, uh, we know the rule. What is the purpose and intent of the rule? We want to protect, you know, vulnerable throwers. You see it on this play, right? Watch the, watch the thrower. They are in a vulnerable position. They are relaxed. They are extended, right? They are not expecting contact, etc. That's why we get this displacement. We get those, you know, if the, if the contact is down low, we're talking about possible uh, knee contact, etc. cetera. Uh, contact with a knee, which would be dangerous, right? All right, fantastic. So we've seen that. That's our baseline play. Let's look at a couple of variations on that play. All right, we've seen that play. Let's look at a couple of variations on the same play. Right, so this is the same game. This is first half action. Okay, so let's think this through. It's the same defensive player with that action. If we see this, let's say we see this early in a game, our brain doesn't make it happen. I, uh, after the fact, I realized we probably should have had a violation on that play. But let's just recognize we need to know as a crew that this is a behavior that this player may exhibit. We have to, we have a couple of options. We can go to that player and say, hey, right, on that free throw, you did this thing. Don't do that again, et cetera. We can talk to them directly. Hey, coach, players are not allowed to this, that, and the other thing. We could be used preventative at the appropriate dead ball. We're not necessarily going to stop the game because we missed it the first time. But we, you know, along the, the game starts, game is being played, players exhibit behaviors, right? Sometimes they rise to the level of something illegal or illegal contact. Sometimes they are, 
just short of that. But they're telling us, they're giving us clues, just like with uh, previous players beyond the arc who, you know, lean forward. They're giving us clues about what they may do in the future, right? And we want to take all that information in so that we can be better in anticipating what might happen next. Not anticipating what we're going to call, but anticipating what may happen, what players' uh, behaviors may exhibit. Give us a chance to remind, hey, as a crew, on free throws, let's be, let's be alert, let's be aware, crossing the line is a possible violation, and also displacement, right? We get that as a crew, we're more focused for the next play. Eh, there we go. So that play occurred in the first half, right? This is NCAA women's, right? So we're not going to have a call on that play. But if this happens in our game, like let's say I'm the lead on this play. Am I? <laughs> let's say I'm the lead on this play. And I think I saw what I think I saw. I'm not necessarily, unless that player, you know, knocked the other player to the floor as lead, I'm not going to come and say, hey, we have a whistle on that play. But I may note that that activity occurred and that's something we need to be aware of as a crew. Next dead ball, chance to communicate that. This is first half action, definitely at halftime. Make sure that it has been addressed so that we don't miss something in the second half. Okay. Also, it's trail here. The trail might say, you know, that's the responsibility of the center. I'm going to live and die with her call on this, etc. But it's something we need to address and to talk about. And so that's the other thing we have to do is make a judgment about the contact, whether the contact was a foul or whether the contact was simply contact. When the, when the emphasis in National Federation first came out, there was a lot of misunderstanding. It's just like if you touch, just like if you touch a thrower on a throw-in, if you touch the thrower on a free throw after you violated, then it's a foul. Should it be an intentional foul? Shooting, you know, there's a lot of consternation, right? We just need to judge it on its merits. A violation has occurred. We're going to protect that player. If there's displacement, or something that rises to that level, as we'll see in the next example, then that deserves a whistle for a foul. Live and die unless it's Crusader. Exactly. If this was a first half play, right? Maybe, and we're the non, we're the official who's not responsible for the play. Then we're going to live and die, partner. We're going to do that, but we're going to address it so that if it happens again, or if it rises, or if there's any energy, like from the opposing coach on this play. Let's say the home coach says, hey, they, no, let's say the visiting coach says, they can't do that. They can't do that. You've got to protect my shooter. Okay, right? <laughs> so we're on watch. We're on notice now. Okay, you guys missed the call. And, right, it's, a, it's an important point to me. So our crew needs to know that and we need to get this play right the next time if it occurs. So let's look at another variation on this very same play. Right. So on this play, on the, on the two previous plays, you could say, the player was simply moving in in sort of a box out position. On this play, the opponent of the thrower throws her hips into the thrower, right? That's a little different action. That is a seeking them out and making this contact while they're in that vulnerable position. That can affect our judgment about the, you know, whether a foul should be called as well. Yeah, so this is an interesting play because of the actions of the, of the opponent of the thrower. The displacement itself was, you know, pro comparable to the other ones, to the other plays that we've seen. But the actions of the thrower may influence our decision about whether or not to put a whistle for a foul on the play. This is first half action. So this kind of behavior early in the game 
If we address it, we have a better game. If we don't address it, we could see this accelerate. And so we all, you know, it's always many things are going to go into our decision on a play like this. There's going to be a lot of factors, but this is if this is, we can see this definitely as a cleanup situation. This occurs in the first period. We get it. We will not have this the rest of the game, right? We would we would hope that 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 we've done that with our call on this play. This is the fourth period with you know 25 seconds to go. Maybe we can't have that same impact, right? So those, these are things to think about. You may want to be pure and say, if it's a foul in the first period, it's a foul in the fourth period. And that is fantastic. You can take that, be consistent with that. As long as you're consistent as a crew and ride with that, that's all good. We know that National Federation of High School would say, we love you for that. If we, you know, we have bad screening in the first half, we put a whistle on it, the screening improves. Again, this is our, this is what we would expect, right? With a process of coaches recognizing talking to their players more. Sometimes sometimes we can put all the whistles we want and things don't improve. But from experience, we know that if we address things early, if we address hand checking early, if we address illegal screens early, if we address behaviors during rebounding action early, then we expect things to improve and make our games better. Something we gain from experience, knowing that if we do that, we get that result. Okay, we're done with displacement of the free thrower. Let's move on to our very next play. <laughs> First I've seen that. Just fake out everybody. <laughs> Like playing, Simon says. Now they're trying to call it a rule. I've I've never seen such a rule where you can't do a pump fake at a uh, foul shot. So that's the fault. Of <laughs> I love this play. I love I love just the basic function of the fake and everybody. Oh wait, White Ten didn't. She she held out. Excellent. But everybody just crashes in. So good. So good. So a lot of stuff on this play. Wow. 51 to 21 is the score in the third period. So let's just talk about the basics of the play. This is illegal by rule. This is a violation on the free thrower. Free thrower is not allowed to fake the throw. This was obviously a fake. We'll see in some subsequent plays, sometimes there could be confusion. The player may have a hitch in their motion, but a fake is a fake. If in our judgment they faked, that is a violation on the thrower by rule. We would either give the, if it's the first, it would, this seems to be the last of free throws, obviously since the players are entering the lane. So this would be a violation on the throwing team, end line throw in to the opponent, and we would move on. But we have confusion by the crew, right? We don't come to that ruling immediately. There is confusion, right? Admiral Akbar, right? He says, maybe this play was taking a play off. You've got the calling official over here as trail, right? Made their call. Maybe they're thinking about their call. They're thinking about 51-21. They're thinking about post-game meal. They're thinking about, you know, that coach, are we going to put up with this, etc. You know, but potentially disengage from the game. This should be a violation by rule. Now, the two officials who are responsible essentially for officiating the play, the center and the lead, get together. There's a discussion. They're talking about we're going to do a redo, maybe. I don't know why. I don't know what the justification would be. We're saying that the opponent violated, right? The players are saying, but she did this, right? So that little voice needs to go off in our head. It says, wait a minute, wait a minute. Do we, are we doing this right? Okay. Even if that means we're going to slow down, we're going to go to our calling official and just say, what do we have? 
what do you have on this play? Maybe we say, hey, mea culpa. I was thinking, I was distracted by something else. What do we have on this play? And get them to talk it through. We give them a chance to slow down. Maybe we give them a chance to, uh, for us to get the play right as a crew. Okay, so always listen to that little voice that says, wait a minute, we may be screwing this up. If we have that, if we have that voice that says, wait a minute, we may be screwing up, act on it. Don't get back to the locker room and said, you know what? I had a little voice saying we may be screwing it up and we screwed it up. Respond to that voice. Doesn't mean we're gonna get the play right, but at least gives us a chance to slow down, think things through, do the processing and do all the things. As always, when we confer on the court, as always, when we confer on the court, we want to have open to the court, right? You know, we can officiate, we're, we're going to communicate, you know, over our shoulder a little bit to each other, be open to players, open to benches as much as possible as appropriate. We have a third official here, but especially in a two-person game, that's our default get together, not you know, face to face where we're not aware and observant of players as well. So that's a great takeaway from this as well. Also note the head nod, right? We're conferring, we're conferring. At the end of the conference, we want to do this. We want that as a crew. Okay, I understand. I have what you have. But I think in the end, we screwed it up. I don't think we fixed it. I think we res we awarded another free throw. I don't recall the, the rationale for why we did, but we did. We screwed it up. Got the play wrong. All right. I love it. I love the clip. I love the fake. I love the players crashing. I love the uh, response to the little voice that said, wait a minute, wait a minute. Right? We need clarity. We need to fix. Slow down. I love the body language of the officials. Opened up to players. But in the end, all that went for naught. And we got it wrong. So a great example of a player faking on a free throw as the thrower faking. Let's take a look at another play that's very similar. Let's go back. Hey, ref. Get out of the way. So this player has a funky hitch in their free throw motion, right? They bounce and then they sort of flex their knees and go. And the player in the marked lane space is fooled by that and enters early, that would be a delayed violation by rule. You could judge that this player faked. Maybe you've seen them shoot free throws before and this is not their free throw motion, right? If we have that context, it could become easier. You could see how this is just that player's pre-shot routine. So if that's the case, even if it's funky, right? Even if there's a hitch, even if it fools the opponent, the responsibility is on the opponent. And this would not be a violation on the thrower. It would be a delayed violation on the opponent of the thrower. That's a judgment that we have to make. Is this the habitual shooting motion of that player? <clears throat> is this the habitual shooting motion of that player? If so, it's a legal play, even if it seems possibly confusing and the responsibility lies on the opponent of the thrower not to violate. So in this instance, this is a delayed violation on gold 22. It's been ruled on your player and they get a replacement and let's say it missed and they, right? They're like, he, you know, the, they may have some feelings about the fact that the player's motion was deceptive, right? We would just work it through. Coach, that I have that as his natural shooting motion. Yes, I could see why it's be, be confusing. Yeah, but by rule, your player has the responsibility, right? We could talk them through the process. Now, we've had two straightforward situations. 
Let's look at another similar situation now. Wow. So that was a nice long clip. A lot of stuff going on. Here's our play. The thrower seems to be actually responding to that initial like hitch by the player in the marked lane space, which is a legal move. What do we have on this play? That's got to be a violation on the thrower. So this is a confusing, you know, potentially confusing scenario. There's a lot of moving parts, it seems, but we have our thrower who stops their free throw motion. What do we have on this play? Okay, so first point. Players are allowed to move in and out of marked lane spaces during free throws. Very straightforward. It's going to happen. Sometimes there can be confusion. Player thinks they're supposed to be in, they're in the wrong spot, etc. Right? As officials, we want to administer the game. We don't want any surprises. We don't want any gotcha. Right? We want to let the players get to where they need to get to, and the crew does that in this instance. What happens next? Right, so we get that step by the player in the marked lane space, legal. They are within the marked lane spaces. We have two players contacting each other, right? Their shoulders are in contact, legal. We got the player in white anticipating the release. Breaks the plane. You could say violation white. But then don't we also have a violation on the thrower for the fake? Interesting, interesting. So let's also address uh, what everybody else notes on this play as well is the crew behavior. Okay, first of all, trail official comes in and says, he's listening, he's listening. I think we're screwing this up. What do we have? Is there confusion? Am I confused? If I'm confused, maybe the stakeholders are confused. Maybe, you know, it hasn't been made clear what the ruling is. Okay, so trail comes in, which is great, and we'll get the crew together. It's going to be a brief conference, right? We make a strategic decision about where we're going to have the conference, but you can see the energy from the officials is all pointing towards each other. In this instance, we need to be aware of the action of the players, okay? If we look at the players while, the, while we're in the conference, you know, are the players in close proximity? 
Are they, you know, able to uh, speak to each other, right? So we have white wants to huddle up, which is all good. You know, you have to know the temperature of the game that you're working, etc. Maybe you feel confident in this, but is there an opportunity? Is there an opportunity for something untoward to happen in this environment and us as a crew not to be aware of it, right? So what we want to do is just have habits, habits that reduce the opportunity for something to happen. If we're in, if we have this conversation as three officials in close proximity talking to each other like this, that's great. If the players are have been sent to their benches, or if we had that same same setup, but we went across the court and did it over here and did it in a more open fashion where we could observe players. Again, we want to have a quick conference here. We don't want to slow the game down and and un unnecessarily. But in the end, we uh, didn't spend enough time slowing the game down, depending on what you think the ruling on the play should be. So we have clarity. We're going to move forward. We're going to award a replacement free throw. So the call would be violation by white. Okay. And if we see on the play, white does violate. It's He's followed by the opponent. Okay. In that instance, we disregard the action of the opponent who was following the first player who violated. So the correct ruling on this play would be, and you could say, okay, but my thrower was distracted by the player entering early. So we're going to ignore their, vi their uh, violation on the play as well. And so we end up with a free throw violation on white and reward a substitute free throw. So that's a great play scenario because there's a lot going on. Again, we see the habits of the officials, which is really critical. Anytime we analyze our game video, did we open a door to possible trouble by some behavior that we exhibited? We turned and looked at the ball, right? Not observing players. We huddled together and didn't observe players, etc. We want to find those, identify those. We may be able to say, yeah, but in that situation, there was this, this, this. But we want to recognize them and improve them for the future. So it's a fun play. It's a fun play for the chaos involved. It's a fun play to see the officials, how they approached it. Love, love the trail coming in. Listening to the voice, slowing things down. Making sure we have an understanding of what we have, whether the whether the ruling is correct or incorrect, right? We we just give everybody an opportunity to slow down, process, and have better opportunity to get the play right. So we've had a great look at plays. Let's look at a bonus play. <laughs> love it love it so billy mack sent the clip you've probably seen it this is like the only known video of a player goaltending a free throw and has an incredible backstory right so um we have a goaltend on a free throw what is the correct ruling we're going to score the goal one point goal. It is a player technical on the player who goaltended during a free throw. We would award two free throws to the team to any teammate, any player or eligible substitute, followed by a division line throw in opposite the table. 
That's in National Federation of High School Rules. So this play actually has a great backstory. The coach tells, yells out, right? Watch this right here. The coach yells out, goaltended, right? On purpose, because remember, NCAA men do things a little bit differently. There's going to be the administration of a tactical foul, but the clock will not run and the team will get the ball at the divi- or on the end line, the result of the free throw on the end line running, and they have 1.2 seconds and a chance to tie the score. It, that, of course, assumed that the player missed the tactical foul free throw, so it was their only chance to possibly win, and they chose that as a strategic decision. So that backstory makes it really interesting. But, um, yeah, so just a, so an interesting play. Is this ever going to happen in your game? We don't think so. The odds are against. The odds are against. So that's a fun play. Uh, yeah, interesting play. Gets into a far little, small little corner of the rules, which is always fun to have an explore in that situation. But now let's move on to a play that's a lot more fun. I cannot help it. I've seen this clip at least a hundred times and every single time it cracks me up. It's so her commitment to, (laughs) to stay with it. No hands down. I'm going, I'm going all the way coach, all the way. Oh, so phenomenal. So what do we have on the play? We have the ball at the disposal of the thrower. Prior to the release, an opponent of the thrower violates and the thrower misses the free throw. (laughs) Love it. So a simple play, a straightforward play, if there had been a a, um, a violation by the thrower, such as an air ball, it would not be a simultaneous fight. I mean, obviously, this is a a real extreme example, although it's inadvertent, of distraction occurring. If you're not distracted by the actual player who falls into the lane, you're at least dis- distracted by everybody on the lane cracking up uh, audibly around you, right? So we're gonna re- award a replacement throw. If there was a violation by the thrower, we would rule distraction and not have a simultaneous violation on the play. And is sometimes as a gymnasium full of people, you celebrate something. You celebrate the, the rendition of the national anthem. You celebrate uh, the, 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 the player, um, you know, the end of the bench, the 30-30 player, the end of the bench player who enters the game and their teammates are all trying to get them the ball. They are a team member. They're trying to get them the ball. And then when they score, the entire bench just goes crazy. You know, they know that that player is maybe not uh, the strongest player on the team, but they got their chance and they scored. And that that energy is really exciting and a great part of the game. And of course, there's always a situation where we have a team manager who suits up for the final game or somebody associated with the team with special needs who gets to suit up and gets to score. And just the place goes crazy. And the overall energy of the gym is so fantastic. It's really a great part of officiating high school basketball. All right, so we've looked at plays today on free throws, free throw scenarios, talked about the things that happen around them, gotten better as basketball officials and gotten better together. Thanks for sticking around to the end of the video. Now would be a great time to do all the things. Hit like, subscribe, notify, and share the video with other basketball officials who could find value. That way we get more officials into the conversation and we can all get better together. Have to give a shout out to our fantastic show supporters, Yvette Perry, Jim Kane, Chris Williams, Jeff Jewett, and Jason Hayes. Much appreciated and much love. You can always buy us a coffee and there'll be a link above and in the show notes below. Fantastic. The other videos in the series are available here. We have the masterclass 
and the basketball rules expert. Full series. We'll see you in the next video. Take care.